Hi, my name is Zhang Li Hu. In previous session, you have a knowledge about cement hydration, including phases assemblage and the microstructure evolution. In this section, I will give you a bit more detailed information about the heat release of cement hydration. More specifically, in a practical point of view, we will have a closer look at the application of isoflanol calorimetry in cement field. The main goal of this module is to introduce two tableaus and two edges, focusing on bridging the isoflanol calorimetry results with the hydration characteristics of cement. Two tableaus are what is isoflanol calorimetry and why do we use it in cement field. Two edges represent how do we perform a calorimetry test and how should we treat the data in order to get the information we want. Calorimetry is the measurement of heat and heat production rate. There are several different kinds of calorimetry commonly used in cement field. Isothermal calorimetry is one of them. Besides this one, which we will mainly focus on today, techniques such as semi-adiabatic or adiabatic calorimetry, solution calorimeters, and differential scanning calorimetry all can be seen in the applications in cement field. The first two types or three kinds of calorimeters are the most frequent used calorimetric methods. Both of them are quantifying the hydration kinetics, but the way for realizing it is different. In isothermal calorimeter, the heat production rate is directly measured. That's why it is also called heat conduction calorimetry. While in semi-adiabatic calorimetry, the sample is isolated and temperature is the signal which is being recorded and later transformed to the rate of heat release. In adiabatic calorimetry, besides the isolation the same as in semi-adiabatic, the calorimeter is also surrounded by an adiabatic shell and the flow of heat from the specimen is prevented. The easiest way to distinguish them are the different time temperature trajectories and sample sizes. As indicated in the figure shown here, temperature is controlled to be constant in isothermal calorimetry, while in other two kinds of calorimeters, the temperature is evolving. Small samples such as cement pastes are commonly used in isothermal calorimetry, while in others, big samples for like mortars and concrete are often used. Let's have a look at the instruments for isothermal calorimetry. There are several commercial instruments brands. We will use Tem Air, produced by TA Instrument Company in US, as an example. If you order a, an isothermal calorimetry, it basically looks like a sealed box. It is composed of a body of channels for samples and an operating temperature control panel. If you look inside, then we can see different parts of the instruments. The three of these are more used for getting a thermostated environment. Principally, the most important part of the calorimeter is the heat collecting place where we circled with a red ring. If we zoom in this part, we can see samples and references are placed in a heat flow sensor and both are on top of a heat sink. The heat produced by the sample will be collected by the sensor as heat is conducted to the heat sink, placed in a thermostat environment. At this moment, we can start to ask ourselves why do we want to use this instrument. Calorimetry is a heat measuring machine. It is actually a generic way of studying processes. As all processes, physical, chemical, and biological, are generally related to enthalpy changes. In addition, cement hydration is an exothermic reaction which is associated with hydration of different main clinker phases with water. The pictures on the right side are typical curves we can obtain from calorimetry measurements. In cement field, isothermal calorimetry is often used on these purposes. 
such as following the hydration processes, adjusting gypsum content, or checking the porcelanic reaction of supplementary cementitious materials. From now on, we will go through all the steps for performing a calorimetry test. In order to give a vivid explanation, some videos will be inserted in the module. Before we can perform a test, make sure that the instrument is in a good condition is very important. This can be done by calibration. Isothermal calorimetry is actually a very stable instrument, but proper calibration will help to significantly reduce noise. Based on heat flow measurement principle, the thermal power P is proportional to the voltage signal from the sensor U, as indicated in the equation. To establish the relationship, two parameters need to be determined. They are calibration coefficient epsilon and baseline voltage U0. Epsilon is measured by electrical calibration. Usually, we do this every three months with the software. U0 is a signal with no heat produced in the sample but a reference inside. The calibration should be done when we change the temperature, the file, or samples. There is another calibration called time constant, which is typically 100 to 1000 seconds. This calibration is not necessary for cement hydration, since the time scale of cement hydration is much longer than this time constant. A complete isothermal calorimetry measurement is composed of two main steps. First step is preparing the reference and performing a baseline. The second step is casting the specimens and starting the experiment. There are basically two ways for preparing the specimen, so-called ex situ and in situ. As the name implies, in the case of ex situ, specimens are cast externally and being poured inside of the glass ampoule. In the case of in situ, the specimens are mixed with L-shaped mixer inside of the ampoule placed in the channel holes. In order to get good reproducibility, ex situ preparation will be shown in this section. First thing we need to do now is to select a reference and prepare it. The principle for choosing a reference is that the reference should have no heat production during temperature change. Commonly used uh, references are water and quartz sand. Please remember to not use old hydrated cement samples, since the hydration of cement, even when it is matured, will not be ended completely. To ensure a stable baseline and reduce background noise, the sample and reference samples should have the same thermal response. This is the rule for calculating the mass of the reference. Here is an example of calculating a reference for 10 gram of cement paste with water cement ratio of 0.4. By knowing the specific heat capacity of water and cement powder, the mass of the reference can be calculated. References for different studied systems should be calculated based on the components and mass of the whole samples. So you should use different reference water for different systems. After putting the reference water in the ampoule, we need to seal it well, as you can see on the slide. Then we place it into the reference side of each channel and instrument. Let's watch a demo together, which shows this process. Different brands may have different design. In time IR, there are different number of channels for different uses. We use in this demo is a channel time IR instrument. Each channel has sample side and reference side, marked as A and B representatively. First of all, we open the plastic black lid, use a steel hook to hand the heat sink plug out. Then we put the reference in, make sure it is going to the bottom, sitting right on top of the sensor. After all this, we can place the plug back and close the lid. 
To start the initial baseline, we will need to create new experiment. In the case of TEMAIR, the software being used is called TEMAIR Assistant. You can see its icon on the slide. Double click to open the software, and at home page, you can click on Experiment in the new menu or click the green icon on the top left. After putting the name of the sample and operator's name, the experimental wizard will be activated. It will guide you through a number of steps, such as selecting calimeter and channels. In next window, you will be reminded to put the reference water inside. And also, you need to put the baseline duration and signal stability condition. Different conditions tell the end of the baseline when different conditions are met. Usually at 20 degrees, the baseline with this condition takes around 30 minutes. If the temperature difference between the reference water and the instrument is higher, then this time, of course, will be longer. In the end, you can see a window shows the recorded baseline. Until the baseline recording is finalized, you will be instructed to put the samples into the calimeter. Now, it's the time to prepare our samples. In order to get reasonable results for calimetry, keep representative raw materials is critical. We need to avoid the phases change due to carbonation or humidity. Briefly, three suggestions can be used for getting good raw materials. Keep materials sealed, use only recent batches, and sample the amount you plan to use from a big container to avoid always opening the big container. In this section, we are going to cast the cement paste with water to cement ratio of 0.4. For one ampoule, usually we use approximately 10 grams of cement paste. This amount will be changed with different types of materials. One principle is to have high enough signal in order to lower the error to signal ratio. Here we weighted 32 grams of water and 18 grams of cement powders in 250 milliliter plastic container. In our case, we only have cement powder, but if you have several different kinds of components of materials, to get homogenized samples, it is better to first dry mix them. We can choose dry hand mixing or machine mixing before casting. For mixing the sample, it is not mandatory to use one specific type of mixer, but the most important thing is to keep using the same mixing speed and duration time. The figure shows the difference for using different speeds because of different shear rates and mixing energy, the samples which mixed with higher mixing speed shows higher heat flow. Before casting, we need to prepare a mixer, a suitable steering pedal for different sample sizes, and a stopwatch. In our protocol, we use mixing speed of 1600 RPM and the mixing time is 2 minutes. Here is another demo shows how we can mix the sample for calimetry test. First of all, we need to adjust the position of the pedal to make sure to have a good mixing efficiency. We put the water into the cement and quickly put the 250 milliliter plastic container under the mixer. While mixing, we need to move up and down or left and right to make sure the sample is homogenized. Don't forget to write down the time you pour the water inside. After the cement paste is ready, we will need to put a certain amount of paste inside of the ampoule. The weight of the paste in the ampoule is important in order to later normalize the total heat release. In this step, we will need to prepare a glass ampoule, a pipette, and a balance. We have another demo showing how we usually do for this step. For ex situ preparation, the sample needs to be fluid enough. Otherwise, we will have some difficulty to put it inside of the ampoule. We cut a bit the pipette, place the empty ampoule on the balance, and tear the balance. Take some paste with the pipette, 
Clean the outside with a tissue. Slowly place the pipette inside of the ampoule. Adjust the position and squeeze the paste out. Keep doing this until you reach the mass you need. Dry down the exact mass. After we finish waiting, we slightly tap the sample and then seal the sample with a lid by using a cap clamping tool. Then we can lower the ampoule and the sample side of the channel with the same way as we did for the reverence water. Here we have some good and bad examples for the sample preparation. Since the sensor is on the bottom of the ampoules, it is better to put the sample to the bottom to make sure that the heat generated is completely collected by the sensor. Now our experiment is going on. We can use the experimental wizard to check how the experiment is going. When the experiment finished, we need to do the final baseline. Principally, it is the same as the initial baseline, and there is another wizard will guide you for all the steps. Just remember, before you do the baseline, you need to take out of the sample but leave the reference inside. To export the data, you need to select which experiment you want to have the data and click Export in File menu. After selecting the information which you want to have, you can export the data as CSV file or Excel file. In this file, you can have the time for the experiment, heat flow, and cumulative heat release. Cumulative heat release is obtained by calculating the integration of the heat flow. Don't forget to add the time during the sample preparation. Slide 26. The last part of the section, we will have a look together at the heat flow result of a normal Poisson cement. Conventionally, the whole heat flow curve go through four or five stages of cement hydration. During each of them, there are different mechanisms behind it. Therefore, it will help us to understand the hydration properties of cement. The first two stages are called dissolution period and induction period. These two stages are associated to the dissolution of ions from solids. The dissolution rate controls the kinetics and the dissolution is higher when the ion concentration in the solution is lower. After some time when the ion concentration goes higher, the dissolution rate slows down. Factors such as fineness of the particle, density of critical defects, temperature and administration will all influence the duration of these two stages. After the first two stages comes the very important stage called acceleration period. This is the main peak of C3S hydration and the rate of acceleration controls by the precipitation and nucleation of CSH. CSH precipitates when the degree of supersaturation reaches the maximum value. This is the period which affects by the mixing rate, fineness of the particles, temperature and the amount of supplementary cementitious materials. The fourth stage is called deceleration period. In this period, heat flow rate starts to decrease. We can see a shoulder which represents the second reaction of aluminate. This one can be used for adjusting the amount of gypsum. The more gypsum we put inside, the later shows the aluminate peak. Sometimes people combine the fourth stage and fifth stage together, since during these stages, the heat flow are always decreasing. As a summary, we listed some advantages and disadvantages of this uh, isophenol calorimetry measurement. One thing you may need to pay attention is that this measurement is still very repeatable at early ages, but after several days, because of low signal, the test is not very reliable. That's all for this module. Thank you.